look at the man is to wonder how Brock Lesnar could have ever lost at all. It was as if he was genetically engineered specifically to be an unbeatable pro wrestler, and to defeat Lesnar should be a pull-the-sword-from-the-stone-like rarity reserved for scant few immortals. Mostly, WWE has agreed with this sentiment, reserving Lesnar's losses for mostly special occasions, but when one looks back over Brock Lesnar's entire time spent inside the squared circle, they find some surprising upendings in there. Now, full disclosure, for entertainment purposes, we included quite a few losses from before Lesnar's time on WWE's main roster, so you're gonna come across some veteran names that went over Brock when the Beast Incarnate was still gaining valuable seasoning. None of those matches are in any way WWE canon, but that doesn't detract from the charm of this list. Due to Lesnar's lofty success and legendary status as a wrestler, realizing that some of the individuals ahead hold victories over him just adds to the already heaping mound of pro wrestling oddities. I'm Sam Driver from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 shocking wrestlers that beat Brock Lesnar. Join us. Number 10, Rico. As with all entries in this video, context is important. When most WWE fans think of Rico, they tend to remember the colorful and flamboyant manager of Billy and Chuck, whose mutton chops were so large that they only played arenas. Prior to that time, Rico still used his Constantino surname and was one of the top stars of Jim Cornette operated Ohio Valley Wrestling. There, Rico reigned on three occasions as OVW heavyweight champion between 1999 and 2001. So when Constantino battled Lesnar at an OVW TV taping in October of 2001, it wasn't all that surprising that the future stylist defeated Brock in singles competition. At the time, Constantino was one half of OVW's Southern Tag Team Champions, with some dude named The Prototype, who quickly dropped off the face of the earth, near as we can tell. Are you sure about that? And in fact, later that month, Constantino and Prototype lost those belts to Lesnar and partner Shelton Benjamin. At the time, both Lesnar and Constantino were being used more and more in house show bouts and in dark matches at WWE TV tapings, as each apparently had a bright future with the company. But their futures, well, they couldn't really have been more different, could they? Number 9, Chris Canyon. Allow us to dust off our best Dennis Hopper impersonation and fire off an aggressive pop quiz, hotshot. Who was the very first individual to defeat Brock Lesnar in a singles match at a main roster WWE event? Go on, you got five seconds, five seconds. This one's really hard, guys. No Googling, you are not gonna believe who it is. We'll have something to say about the more widely recognizable answer to that question later. But then what's the technical answer? Well, you'd have to go back to Saturday, October 20th, 2001. One day before the then WWF broadcast their No Mercy pay-per-view from St. Louis. It was 125 miles west in Columbia, Missouri, before less than 3,000 fans in the fourth match of a mostly throwaway house show that Lesnar took the fall to former Alliance MVP Chris Canyon, falling victim to Canyon's flatliner. At the time, Canyon was slipping down the Alliance's depth chart, particularly as more WWF defectors overrode the genuine WCW hires, so this wasn't exactly a white-hot name felling Lesnar. In all likelihood, Lesnar losing was probably probably a test designed to see if he put up any resistance to being asked to lose. After all, Lesnar wasn't going to be debuting on WWF television until after WrestleMania the following spring, and it's not like mobile phone footage of house shows was all that prevalent in 2001, so it was hardly a costly defeat. Number 8, Billy Gunn. The Billy Gunn Facts account on Twitter speaks boldly and confidently about all things Lord and Master Monty Sop, because they understand the power that lies within the 1999 King of the Ring. Among the many distinctions that Billy Gunn can lay claim to, perhaps none is more impressive than having a victory over Lesnar to his credit. It may sound preposterous to you, the Billy Gunn denier, and actually, yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's wrong. Billy Gunn doesn't hold a victory over Brock Lesnar. He holds two victories over Brock Lesnar, yeah! On consecutive nights right after the 2001 No Mercy pay-per-view, Gunn battled Lesnar in dark matches at both the Raw and SmackDown tapings in Kansas City and Omaha, respectively. On both occasions, the power of ass vanquished all, as Gunn conquered the future conqueror in back-to-back -back outings. But seriously, we do understand that this was probably just part of the process of getting Lesnar acclimated to working major arenas in front of 10 to 20,000 fans, and working with a veteran like Gunn, 
who today is a respected coach in AEW, could only aid in his development. Nonetheless, it's another shining example of imagine this result occurring on SmackDown just a year from that date. Number 7. Albert Speaking of veteran WWF stars that went on to become respected coaches and mentors, that brings us to the current head trainer at WWE's Performance Center. At the time of the match we're about to discuss, Albert was in this weird place in WWE where he was just getting out of X Factor, but was still on the verge of becoming Scotty Two Hotties' new buddy nicknamed the Hip Hop Hippo. If Matt Bloom ever set up a LinkedIn profile written entirely in kayfabe, it'd be more than worth everyone's time to read. But in between those two unforgettable eras, Albert was doing something extraordinary. He was beating young Brock Lesnar in a dark match at the SmackDown tapings in Fayetteville, North Carolina on November 20th, 2001. While this untelevised bout felt mostly innocuous, it apparently spawned major beef between two very beefy boys. That explains why a year and a half later, Lesnar tried to murder Albert with the most horrifying F5 known to man. It took three years and a change of promotion and continent to get a proper blow off when Lesnar faced Albert for the IWGP heavyweight title at the 2006 New Japan Cup special. And you thought AEW invented subtle long-form booking. Number 6. Lance Storm you may be sensing a bit of a pattern when it comes to the names on this list, particularly in regards to those who wrestled a young Brock in untelevised bouts. Storm is widely considered one of the best trainers and teachers in the industry by a vast spectrum of peers and protégés, and that respect toward him dates back to his time as an active wrestler. While in limbo following the death of the Alliance, Storm was paired with Lesnar for a house show run in the first weekend of 2002, and remembers the experience well. On these occasions, Storm scored a pair of victories victories over Lesnar on a Friday and Saturday night before Lesnar notched a return win on Sunday. Storm lords Brock for being a quick learner, saying in a 2019 interview, We went out on the first night, we had our match, and I came back. He sat down, I'm like, alright, you know, change the way you do this, do this a little bit more, do this a little bit less, and fix this. And he's like, okay. And the next night, anything I told him was fixed. Storm also noted that in spite of Lesnar's imposing frame and large musculature, he never once hurt him with anything. Thing. Number 5. Hugh Morris the real-life Bill DeMott's time as a trainer may have ended under a billowing plume of controversy, but through Tough Enough and the Performance Center, his list of successful students is nonetheless pretty impressive. Brock Lesnar may have not been an official pupil of DeMott's, but he did work with The Laughing Man on a few occasions en route to his TV debut. And like some of the prior names on this list, DeMott wasn't really doing a whole lot as a character at this point. One week after working the house show loop with Storm, Lesnar was paired up with one of Storm's former WCW rivals at Live events in the state of Texas. The Saturday-Sunday twofer concluded with DeMott winning both matches, before Lesnar went on to defeat fellow prospect Randy Orton in a dark match at a SmackDown taping that Tuesday night. At the time of the matches with DeMott, Lesnar had been on the house show circuit for close to three months, wrestling with a variety of veterans as well as his OVW peers. If there were any temptations to call up the impressive Lesnar ahead of schedule, the WWF did a good job staving off the urges, instead giving us a much more finished product. Number 4. Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig's final WWE tenure came to an end following the so-called plane ride from hell, as his part in the fiasco involved competitively jostling with Lesnar on board the beleaguered flight. That said, Lesnar cherished Hennig, holding his fellow Minnesotan in very high regard. In fact, Hennig had a hand in training Lesnar and gave him a piece of advice that Brock holds dear. Get in to get out. In other words, don't become a statistic in what can be a cold business. In his memoirs, Lesnar lamented the fact that Hennig didn't exactly follow his own advice, though. Nonetheless, Hennig was a vital part of Lesnar's development and was apparently the man who had talked him out of using the shooting star press as a regular finish, saying that it wasn't worth the risk. He also wrestled Brock three times in early 2002, going over in all three dark matches. Unfortunately, Hennig's brief and unexpected renaissance with the promotion didn't really do much to recapture the old Mr. Perfect magic. A proper match pitting 1990 Mr. Perfect against 2003 Brock Lesnar would have been a sight to see, especially giving Hennig's poncho for ragdolling around the ring like a lawn chair in a windstorm. One can only wonder what that F5 cell would have looked like. Number 3. Bradshaw 
Make no mistake, this wasn't John Bradshaw Layfield, stock market guru who bombastically flaunts his wealth and success. No, no, this was slightly post-APA Bradshaw, still with the long hair that made him look like the bass player for a Pantera cover band. With he and Farouk split following the first ever WWE draft, Bradshaw became a drinking buddy of Stone Cold's over on Raw. This particular run would have been mostly forgettable if not for one little detail. Bradshaw was the first man to pin Brock Lesnar after Lesnar debuted on the main roster. The match in question took place at an April 2002 house show in Abilene, Texas, home of the Abilene Christian University, to which Bradshaw is a proud alumnus. About 8,000 fans watched the local legend take down the mighty Lesnar with the clothesline from hell. One could argue that Bradshaw's big hometown victory could have come over any wrestler, say Just Incredible or Spike Dudley or Lesnar dressed as one of the conquistadors, but in fairness, most people don't even realize that the match took place. Protective Booth Looking aside, it's not like Lesnar had a winning streak that encompassed house shows a la Goldberg, because he wasn't Goldberg. That's why the fans chanted Goldberg's name during Lesnar's matches in 2002, be because he wasn't Goldberg. Number 2. The Big Show well, if Lesnar had an on-screen wrestling streak a la Goldberg, it definitely died at the 2002 Survivor Series. In a shade over four minutes, Lesnar advocate Paul Heyman turned on the now WWE Champion, enabling Big Show to turn the tide and capture the gold inside Madison Square Garden. It wasn't the first time Lesnar had been pinned, but it was the first time it had happened to him on main roster WWE television. Certainly, it was the first meaningful loss he'd suffered as the next big thing. And it shouldn't be all that shocking that a 500 pound monster like Big Show took him down, but actually, it was. Rumors circulated in the weeks before Survivor Series that Show was going over, and it was mystifying because Big Show had been ice cold for the majority of 2002. This was the year, after all, in which he was left off WrestleMania entirely and spent the night hanging out with fans at WWF New York. Mounting losses, dating back several years actually, had stripped Big Show of any sense of awe. In spite of his giant frame, Show was by no means seen as being on Lesnar's level at the time of the 2002 Survivor Series. Though there were storyline reasons for the switch, time still hasn't been kind to it. And number one, Goldberg. Really, pick one. When Bill Goldberg signed a one-year deal with WWE in 2003, it became somewhat apparent as time went on that he wasn't likely to re-up with the company long term. When Deman was positioned as Lesnar's opponent for WrestleMania 20, it seemed like an easy win for company back Brock. Until an annoyed Lesnar announced that he was quitting too, making for quite the lame duck WrestleMania battle. Still, given a choice between the two, you'd figure WWE would have Brock go over since he's one of their homegrowns. More than 12 years later, Goldberg returned for another go-round, and immediately renewed old hostilities with his fellow heavyweight machine. The two were lined up for the 2016 Survivor Series, and it looked for all the world like Lesnar was going to get a revenge win. And that was the plan, until WWE motivated by the strong TV numbers Goldberg's return had done, hashed out a longer-term deal with the former WCW star. The new plan entailed having Goldberg annihilate an arrogant Lesnar in 90 seconds, to set the stage for later conflicts. Nobody watching knew the plan at the time, so when Lesnar stayed down for the jackhammer, well, Color Rush shocked. 